Yeah, we are Ivy Lab. I'm Jay, this is Gove, and welcome to our humble little studio where we're going to be talking a little bit about how we make music and walking through one track in particular. Um, obviously, working as a duo, um, we will have different tracks that either of us might have started off originally or worked on afterwards or, co or contributed to more or less but I think that certainly the track we're going to go through today um, is um, representative of our music in the sense that it's quite sparse and minimalistic and the ethos behind it is having a relatively small number of different track components working as hard as they possibly can um, in some different incarnations, but ultimately the same family of sounds to uh, create a really unified effect. And on this track, we've got a couple of rappers who are um, amongst our favorite British rappers out there at the moment, Ono Capono and Elsie Roselli. And uh, this particular track, um, I know, you know, I think, uh, Gove has, uh, Gove has commandeered uh, the, the large majority of this track and done a really amazing job of taking these guys' vocals and melding them to a track which existed as an instrumental um, probably a year or two years prior. More, two years ago. Two years prior to, to the track coming it's, together and we, you know, we yeah, wanted like there a, to be vocals to it. It's but. an instrumental that we've sat on for a long time and considered quite a few different people and got quite far down the process of asking people to, um, to to think about writing lyrics for before the opportunity to work with Ono and LZ came around and they were I think probably subconsciously amongst the people who this track was written for so when that mm. came together it was a really big deal yes. and we were really happy to be working with them yes uh, and kind of relish the challenge as well yeah, you know, there's only been so many tracks so far that we've done um, featuring vocals, and it also obviously brings in its own set of um, of, of challenges. But um, yeah, in terms of walking through uh, this track, go if you want to sort of take the lead and talk through a bit about how you brought that all together. We've been writing music with each other for about nine years, um, and so we know each other's workflow quite well and have somewhat amalgamated in terms of our approach to writing music. So I guess that gives a certain amount of fluidity when it comes to things like which one of us starts a track, which one of us finishes it, what we do to it. I think it's quite, I think it's quite free roaming in that respect and the process usually is just that. Someone often starts a track on their own, I think it's fair to say, mm -hmm. certainly a majority of the time and we amass a kind of collection of demos and every so often you know when, whenever we get together we'll, we'll play through some of those and the stuff that kind of sticks out as being a good candidate to, to, to flesh out either gets worked on together for a little bit or one of us takes it we've each actually got studio setups um, um, of, of our own so one of us might take a track and, and flesh it out a little bit, or we might both do it together, and then the next stage will be the original person taking it again. There's no real rule or thing that happens with every track. Um, we know how, uh, we know what each other likes, and that means we can be quite free with that sort of process, I think. Just, come, just, just covering the basics of our workflow, this is obviously logic and it's been our walk our workhorse for 10 years when i first met jay he was using reason yeah you're right you were yeah, using yeah. reason and we were trying to use rewire to make things work mm. i said this is not going to work please start using logic yeah. you're pretty pretty happy to get off reason i think once you saw what logic was capable of obviously up until a couple of years ago we were a trio as well there was a third member and all of us were in logic he had a bit of um uh, he had a bit of an affinity with Ableton that just neither of us have really been able to pick up. It bothers us. We really want to be good at Ableton, but I just think we're so stuck in our ways using Logic and the, and, and the way you arrange and the way you set things up that we've 
kind of just got quite stuck into all of this, but that's fine, it works for us. And um, it means that we can collaborate really easily because as Jay was saying, uh, we tend to make early stage demos to about the 20% completion stage and dump those into, I'll show you. We dump those into a big repository of demos. So this is currently all the stuff that we've got that's re I mean, probably some of this has been- Could do a clearing out. Could probably do, do a bit of clearing out, but you know- Stuff the, that needs finishing. The very top half of this folder, especially, you know, some of the some of the subfolders is, is are are things that we'd be making towards particular ends and have left meaningfully at the twenty percent stage because we are making two different types of track at the moment. We are making instrumentals for rappers and we are making fully fledged self contained dance floor hip hop instrumentals which need to be developed and arranged in a different way. So we make demos that could f go in either path but we leave them flexible and leave them in this big cache of tracks that we can then go away and decide what we're going to do with it at a later stage when opportunities become available to us um, and that's kind of the way we've been working for a while now mm -hmm. you know trying not to take stuff to too great a level of completion in case we need to roll back on ideas there's a lot of diplomacy that's involved in that as well if you if you get to a stage with a track where the other person is just not into it, and I think because we understand what each other's, not red lines, but preferences are, um, if we start to encroach on some of that territory, we go, actually, I'm not gonna take it this far just yet. We're just gonna hold back, see what the other person thinks, see if they're into the whole idea in the first place, and if they are, fine, we'll, we'll continue it. And if not, it can live in that folder till someone has a, has a fresh take on it, or we can strip out the ideas and take it elsewhere. Yeah. If anything, it's just a way of cataloging where stuff might be that we can go to down the line. Get here on a get here on a Monday, and we've got no particular idea what we're planning on doing with music. Go through that folder, just get a sense of oh, we forgot about this. Let's go mm. and reload this project. Let's let's revive this. Um, I mean, quite a lot of the time we do show up and we have an agenda of what we want to do for that day in the studio. Yeah. But if we don't, it's just a fun day, a free day. Yeah. Go to the demos folder. Yeah. What can we work on? There we go. We, we, we move on from there. We definitely allow ourselves to get sidetracked. And I think it's important to know when to take a, a break from working on a certain track and having those other tracks around that you can go, do you know what, let's like switch to being able to work on that is really useful so you don't just go crazy working on a certain track and getting lost in all of the uh, project alternatives that we like to save as well. So it's definitely good having a greater, a greater cache of music to work on. And I think one of the most important things I think about working uh, as a team on, on, on music production is knowing that there are going to be times where you might have to either do, do one of two things that can be kind of uncomfortable either undo or like delete essentially like a whole bunch of you know stuff you really believe should be in a track or um go with someone else's ideas that at least initially you're maybe not really like feeling because there has to be a trust there that hold on, let me take this to completion. Um, yeah, essentially trust me, you know, this is gonna come good. And um, it's, it's not, I don't wanna so much say compromise because I don't think we ever allow a track to come to completion and then get to release unless both of us are like fully behind it. And that's the most important thing. But the process towards that, I think it's, it's, it's super important to be kind of flexible and not, um, not just kind of be too stubborn about, you know, obviously everything needs to be, because our, our tastes and our approach to music, you know, uh, uh, have, have, have come together in a really similar, but of course you have those little pockets where you're like, oh no, you know, I, I think differently about the direction of this particular angle of a track. So, you know, you need to be really uh, trusting and willing to kind of make some compromises there. And I think as time's gone on, it's just, you know, we've, we've, we've learned how to kind of be diplomatic about that more and more and then you know, you get these end products and you're, you're, you know, you're both totally happy with them. And there's, it feels, it needs to feel really like balanced, you know, at all stages. And I think, I think it does for us. 
I think also the psychology of compromise is made easier by this being a home studio because there are places that mm. we can escape to when we hear something compositionally happening that we're unsure of and the temptation is to interfere and break the cycle the other person is, is, is working in. Whereas certainly for me, actually no, for, for, for both of us, if it gets to a point where there's something happening on the screen and you can't fathom the vision the other person has, you'll leave the room. Right, you'll just go and hang out in the living room. I'll go hang out on the sofa at the back of the room. Yeah. Just take myself out of the yeah. situation for a while, go on my phone, go on my laptop, do something else, uh, listen quietly in the background of, what, of what's going on, yeah. but remove yourself from the situation so you don't have that temptation to tinker yeah. and break the, the flow that the other person yeah, has, exactly. got, has got themselves into. Yeah. And that's partly why we're in a home studio. I mean, for, for a couple of years we paid a pretty healthy sum to be in a nice soundproofed recording studio environment up in Tottenham, which was filled full of really interesting creatives and had a really good buzz about it. But we did have our own room, that was our space. And as soon as you open the studio door, that was public space. There wasn't necessarily the ability to escape. Um, and also our, our ability to actually get there and use it when we felt creative mm. was wasn't wasn't always available to us. We were sharing the studio with other people, mm. and when we had a cool idea, but it was their day to have the studio, that idea could easily perish because the best speakers, the best pieces of kit, were all up in that studio. Yeah. Since that time, we've split bits off. The cool sound card is with me. The cool speakers are with you. The cool keyboards, well, we, we both got the same keyboard, but you know what I mean? Like we, we, we split everything up and now working at home is a much more, um, I think it's a much more relaxed environment that's way more conducive to actually making music um, in, a, in a kind of free flowing sense as opposed to, right, these are our days in the studio, mm. we've got 12 hours to be creative, let's get creative now. It just mm. doesn't work like that for us. Mm. I'm sure some people, it does work like that, but it, just, it really mm. wasn't there for us. And it's jarring. Mm. You, spend a, you spend a day where you're paying lots of money for a studio, you get to the end of the day and you've created nothing. Like it yeah. feels, feels problematic. And so we got out of that situation a year ago and now we're here in a home studio. And I don't mean, we no shame or no regrets about that at all. No. This, is, this is way better working like this. Yeah. So we, both of us, have almost identical setups. In fact, my computer is a mirror of yours. When I, when I bought mine, uh, we we mirrored the operating system and then started installing stuff to try and make it as fluid as possible. Yeah. Um, everything we do, we do within Dropbox. Mm. So all of our projects, all of our samples, all of our uh, sound libraries, our sound fonts that go inside EXS24, which is still our sampler of preference, um, all of that exists within Dropbox. So as we are making things, as we are adding things to projects, they automatically get uploaded, you press save. If I'm in my studio, which is a couple of miles away from here, I can just pick up on that. The vice versa can be true as well. Um, so that's kind of structurally where all of our stuff exists. It's in the box. There's a, a Mac Pro down there under the table. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I'm on, I'm on a little Mac Mini at my place. And you'll notice there's no keyboards or synths or outboard stuff. And I think part of that is I guess we don't get direct satisfaction from noodling and playing with toys mm -hmm. and definitely understand the virtue and utility of having those things in a studio. It can, uh, it can bring a lot of dynamis dynamism and um, I guess uh, fun and entertainment to the actual studio process. So you're not just sat at this workstation, you can meander between different things. But I don't think we need those things to keep ourselves interested in making Music, we're quite happy just being in the box and it kind of suits our workflow. So yeah, between Logic, a handful of, uh, of, uh, of soft synths, EXS24 and a, pre a pretty decent repository of samples that, I mean, on a personal level, I've been collecting these sample CDs and sample packs for like 15, 17, 18 years. You know, some really old early, early sample CDs that I've ripped and they're still in here and form a pretty decent core of, um, of what we, we go to to get just one, one shots. Um, and 
once they're in there, they all end up in logic. Uh, this up here is a um, is a track called Space War. It's the title track of the Space War EP um, that uh, we've written, which which features this title track with two rappers, Ono Capono and LZ Roselli, both of which have really interesting challenges to work with because their voices uh, are very different. But also, they like to home record, and that's their preference. If we were asked, if we were, if we were to ask them to come to a studio and record, I think they'd be happier and more comfortable in their own home space. So what we have to deal with is their recordings, which arrive in a kind of mishmash of files that we had to piece together, and a mishmash of volumes. There's quite a lot of challenges to actually dealing with all of that, but. Um, We'll, let's go through and, and, and see how that's done. So if you, uh, this, this looks super simple, but these are all track stacks. And if I open one of these up, all of this kind of duck egg stuff is, um, is stuff that features in the beats, right? So at the very top, um, you've got your drums, you've got a bunch of different bass channels, and you've got a bunch of incidental sounds. It's a very sparse track. It doesn't have a lot of, uh, melody or non baseline instrumentation in it. Uh, so actually a lot a lot of this stuff is just playing one individual sound. There's not tons of melodies taking place inside here. So the second one of these stacks is um, Ono's vocals. And the way this is structured is it's pretty simple. He's done his verse in, you know, two or three little takes. Uh, he's got a mid-intensity ad-lib that he's got. Um, let's just open this up a little bit. You can see, you know, just every fifth, tenth word he's accentuated. Uh, and then a more shouty version of, of um, the same words, uh, an even shoutier version of some of the words. And then these three here all belong to the other rapper, Elzy, and all required a slightly different treatment um, because obviously his tonality of his voice is, is quite different from Ino's. If you look at Elzy's, even more takes here, which needed comping together. Um, there's quite a lot of flex time stuff that's happened in here as well. They had down to the syllable preferences for how stuff um, got moved around and how they'd like fixes done to some of their delivery. And so there was just, you know, there was just the, the odd word that needed to be made a little bit louder. And that's that's as simple as, um, so for this, for instance, would be a good example, adding 5 dB of gain to this particular word. So it's a little bit like writing a fader, but rather than doing it uh, through volume automation, it's, it's more a case of we're chopping individual words that we don't think have hit loud enough and using this this gain addition feature, which I think has been in a couple of the last iterations of Logic, um, we are, we're 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 tweaking the volumes of the uh, uh, of the verse that he's recorded. Much the same thing with ad libs. He's got a couple of different deliveries of them. This is more or less a left or right of the same thing, um, and a uh, a few kind of incidental like this is like a, a scream noise that he's put in there this little her that he's put in there it's um it's all it, it's all fairly simple most of the the heavy lifting in this has been done just tweaking the individual volumes of uh uh of words and syllables that didn't quite hit hard enough or were encountering interference with a snare or with a kick or something that was was forcing them to lose a bit of their power so just needed to be 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 bumped up a little bit and then the same thing again we've got a chorus uh, which is way more of a mess uh, because this got delivered to us in three separate stages so if you can see these big recordings in the middle these are things that got added at the end they'd we'd, we'd constructed a chorus here which is essentially this and then they'd gone away, heard the track, and decided to come back with extra bits and pieces, and and those all needed to be slotted in somehow. Um, 
But part of the the the, the purpose of structuring structuring these in um, in stacks and these are folder stacks. These are not summing stacks. The difference being, if I if this was a summing stack, this channel here would uh, look like a um, like a bus. And at the moment, essentially, it's a, it's a glorified mute and solo button. Um, it doesn't actually have any signal flow that goes through there. Part of the reason is we want to control where these things go to. You can, so you can see here that these are all arriving at different buses. If this had been made as a summing stack, they would have all gone to this one bus. And actually, that's not, not what we wanted. So this is more a housekeeping thing and trying to, well, you can see, without the stacks, this is what the project looks like. And that can feel a bit overwhelming at points in time, even with the color coding. So, you know, just, just I'm going to spend a session working on the chorus. And that's a lot easier once you've got rid of everything else. Um, I think for beats, there's, there's a pretty consistent, there's a pretty consistent flow to how we, um, how we engineer our beats. I mean, we tend to drum bus everything, mm. um, group everything together, trying to, trying to push all of this stuff through like a, a uniform experience, I guess you could, you could say. Yeah. I mean, most of our drums end up having, well, at the moment, they all end up having like a distortion plug-in with isotope trash and then mm. a glue, which is what we use. It's our favorite um, compressor plug-in. This drum bus actually doesn't have that plug-in on, but I'm sure it appears somewhere else, like on our on our bass. But drum buses are usually quite simple, either some sort of effect like distortion, then yeah, EQ and compression. EQ, we're using the the uh, channel EQ that comes with Logic. Uh, they improved it uh, a couple of years ago, and it's it's pretty flexible now. We'll either use this or a Fab Filter one, and then we've the got Pro Q, yeah, the Pro Q, the Fab Filter one, yeah, and then we've got this uh, Cytomic the glue, which is just I think we just use it because it's really nicely transparent, really, don't we? It's super transparent, and if you want to get color out of it, you have to drive it this far. You know, 18 dBs of, uh, of reduction uh, and then adding another 16 dBs in, that's how far you need to push it to get any color out of the glue. It's not designed really to, to, to work this way, but it does sound pretty good when it's driven quite hard. Mm -hmm. And it creates almost this kind of granular effect. Um, and I, I think this is, um, it's an SSL emulator. That's what the, the glue is meant to be. And I think most of these SSL emulators all sound pretty similar to each other. But this one does sound pretty good when it's driven really hard. And you'll find it in our workflow in two different forms. If you, if you look at our channels, you'll see that it exists quite often as the last thing on individual channels um, just to, like th there's a good example there. It's not doing anything except keeping stuff on zero. And, you know, we appreciate that Logic's got a lot of headroom above zero dB here, but we're trying to avoid any red lights anywhere. It just makes it easier for us to know that everything is, is nice and limited at, at, um, at zero dB and nothing is going above that. So that's one of its functions. And that really is about transparency and um, embracing the transparency it brings. And then the second function is more along the lines of what this thing is doing here. Really ragged, push quite hard, trying to force it to be as colorful as possible. And that's more of the usage you'll get on things like a drum bus or a vocal bus. It's, um, that's kind of its, it, 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 its purpose in that sense. Um, thanks for listening. That's kind of the time we've got for today. I hope it's been useful to you. Um, if you want to check out the rest of this interview and some more info, go grab the latest copy of Computer Music. There's more in there.